All right, it's really a pleasure to be here today. So my lab does research at the intersection of education and neuroscience. And one of the tenets of this talk is gonna be that interdisciplinary work catalyzes discoveries that aren't possible within the confines of any specific discipline. So most of the research in my lab starts off looking like this, intervention studies or, or uh, tests of different educational curriculum, usually in small groups of children. And as a neuroscientist, I see these education programs as a powerful tool to understand how experience shapes brain development. We can ask basic unanswered questions about how a child's experience in the world, how their experience interacting with educators, interacting with different curriculum, actually sculpts the development of specific brain circuits. Now, at the same time, we can use neuroscience, so our measurements of brain development in these children, as a tool where we hope to use these data to predict learning and personalize education. The broader idea is that having a better, deeper, more precise model of an individual brain development and how they interact with their learning will help us personalize education to that individual's needs. So my lab focuses on reading, and to, for those of you that don't spend your days thinking about reading, I want to start off with a couple fundamental points. So the two people in this photo see fundamentally different things, and they will continue to for years. Well, I look at the page of this book, and I can't help but hear the sounds of language that were written down by the author. My daughter just sees a series of pretty pictures here. And now, years later, even though she's walking and talking, able to communicate, she's four years old right now, she's uh, very adept in oral language, but still written language is meaningless to her. The literacy was invented by modern societies. This means that our brains are not pre-wired for reading. No amount of books sitting in front of my daughter will uh, awaken literacy within her. Instead, literacy is something that requires instruction. The neural circuitry of literacy is constructed in response to education, and therefore literacy depends on the brain's capacity for plasticity. A child's interactions with their parents, their early educators, literally sculpt the circuits that allow the brain to perform this incredible feat. Now with this in mind, since the brain did not evolve specifically for literacy, it may come as no surprise that many children, as many as 10%, maybe more, uh, struggle learning to read, and this is something we call dyslexia. So to illustrate this point here, I want to examine what's going on in my brain versus my daughter's brain as we stare at this book. So when our eyes move to the first image in this book, the picture of a rabbit, things start off in a roughly similar way. Images captured by our retina are sent to the back of our brain, our primary visual cortex, which starts analyzing the structure of this image. And signals move through our brain through a series of circuits along the base of our brain coming from the back up to the front that are involved in visual recognition, taking this image and recognizing rapidly that we're looking at a picture of a bunny rabbit. Now things are fundamentally different as soon as my eyes move to the text in this book. For my brain, a specific region that's involved in visual word recognition becomes active, and this immediately plugs into my spoken language circuitry, transforming this written language into, um, into uh, a rich language representation that my brain can comprehend. For my daughter, instead, these language circuits don't become active until I start reading to her. Of course, I'm not just flipping through the pages, I'm reading out loud. And as soon as I start reading out loud, these spoken language circuits, my daughter's brain become active. Essentially, what you can think of the process of literacy as plugging the brain's visual system into its language circuitry in a new way, allowing visual signals to reach the circuits in our brain that evolve for communication. Now, one key thing in the brain to allow this to happen are the white matter connections, the bundles of wires that connect these circuits together. Two uh, bundles of wires in particular, one known as the arcuate fasciculus that's important for language skills, another called inferior longitudinal fasciculus that takes information from our visual cortex and shares it with the rest of the brain. The development of these white matter connections, these tracks that connect these circuits together, is critical for reading development. So a few key points to remember throughout this talk. First is that literacy prompts the development of specialized circuits in the visual cortex for rapid and automatic word recognition. Second, in the literate brain, written words are processed like spoken words. The brain's visual system is plugged into our language networks in a new way. Third, the structural connections, these bundles of wires that connect our visual system with our language circuits are essential for reading. And finally, the development of the circuit goes awry in some children, and this is what we refer to as dyslexia. So based on this, we can ask the question, what is different about the dyslexic brain? And to summarize a wealth of research in one quick slide, 
Well, one thing we know is that efficient communication between visual, auditory, and language regions is critical for skilled reading. And the white matter, or the bundles of wires that connect together these regions, are critically important for reading development. So what I'm showing in this slide here is a rendering of two white matter pathways, two connections between the brain's reading circuitry. And when I show renderings like this, I want you to think of an analogy to this image over here of a NASA supercomputer, where these bundles of wires allow information to be transferred between disparate brain circuits rapidly, allowing circuits to communicate uh, for, for, to process complex information like written language. Now, when we examine children with dyslexia, we see subtle differences in the, the patterns of white matter connections, subtle differences in the way these tracks are structured in, in the child's brain. And this uh, brings up the question of what are the implications of differences in the brain? When we measure differences between two children, how should we interpret them? And particularly, should we be thinking about this in terms of a stable trait, where differences in the brain are, are something that uh, is just intrinsic to the child and can't be overcome? Or should we be thinking about these as terms of something that's plastic, that's malleable, that, for example, a child's interactions with their educators are actually going to shape and, and redefine the way these brain regions are structured? So to get at this question of can we influence brain development through a targeted intervention program, my lab recently ran a study where we brought in 34 children with dyslexia for an intensive reading intervention program. This was a program involved one-on-one -on -one training, so I bolded the word intensive because it's four hours a day, five days a week for eight weeks, where children are working one-on-one -on -one with highly engaged, trained instructors who are working with them on the building blocks of literacy, segmenting and blending speech sounds together, building and deconstructing words with new letter com combinations, working on sounding out new words, and constantly practicing building up reading fluency. We find this intervention program improves reading skills over the course of eight weeks of summer vacation. So this is showing behavioral data, showing children's improvements over the course of the intervention program. There's three different measures of reading abilities here, one of reading accuracy, shown in orange, one of reading speed, shown in green, and one of reading fluency, shown in blue. This gray period here is a baseline period where we collected these measures over the course of the typical school year before children entered the intervention program. These measures were flat. They then enter the intervention, so you can see the intervention period here over eight weeks, where they're coming into the lab every two weeks, and they show systematic growth in all these measures. So on average, children are going from about the 10th to about the 30th percentile. It's about one grade level or a little bit more change over the course of summer vacation. One other note is that we see variable growth. Some children show transformative change, showing two to three grade levels of improvement over the course of summer, where others show more limited growth. So now to a key question for my work, how do we measure brain connectivity? So we're going to use diffusion MRI. This is a non-invasive MRI measurement that indexes the flow of water through brain tissue. We're going to use this to understand how this learning program sculpts brain development. So to give you an analogy to understand how these measures index uh, brain connections, I want you to think about the brain's white matter tracks, these connections between the brain as pipes that carry water. So we're measuring the movement of water. And if you imagine that we create more insulation, better insulation around these pipes, that's going to mean less water diffusion. So measuring the rate of water diffusion in the brain gives us an indication of the level of insulation around these pipes, around these connections between brain regions. For those of you that prefer an analogy to computers, you can think of a decrease in water diffusion as indicating a higher bandwidth or denser packed connection between brain regions. Now, one of the beauties of these measures is a child lies in the scanner, and since it's a measure of the structure of the brain, not the activity of the brain, the child can watch their favorite movie. We've always found that Frozen tends to be the most popular one nowadays. So a child's lying in the scanner. We're measuring the structure of these brain connections. The data is coming off the scanner. My lab writes analysis pipelines that extract measures of diffusion for individual connections within each individual's brain. So let's look at one of those over the course of this intervention program. We'll look at the arcuate fasciculus, this key connection for the brain's reading circuitry. This is showing a measure of water diffusion in these ch children when they begin the intervention. And then immediately within the first two weeks of intervention, after 50 hours of working with this instructor one-on-one, -on -one, we already see a highly significant decrease in water diffusion, so indicating uh, uh, an increase in the density of tissue within this connection in the brain. This change continues and persists over the course of the intervention, and we don't see this type of change in our control group. 
So we see highly significant decrease in diffusion in our intervention group and no change in our control group. And this is an indication that this type of intervention program is changing the physical structure of the brain, changing the, the, the nature and density of connections between different brain regions, as opposed to just teaching a new strategy. The other thing we find is that these changes in brain connectivity track the learning process. So within each individual, we see the trajectory of plasticity in these white matter connections, tracking their growth and reading skills. And these findings motivate the question of whether we can engineer new MRI methods to monitor brain plasticity and learning. This is something that we're thinking about day to day is how can we improve the nature of our measurements and actually think about these non-invasive brain imaging technologies as a, a tool to measure plasticity and learning in the brain. So a couple takeaways. Reading difficulties are associated with differences in brain connectivity. Second, even in children with severe dyslexia, interventions are highly successful. Intensive interventions change the underlying wiring of the brain's reading circuitry. So this means that evidence-based education or intervention programs are literally sculpting brain development. Now, finally, we see that plasticity occurs in synchrony with the learning process. And this motivates us to constantly think about new methods to monitor brain plasticity and learning. This is something that's a current focus in my lab. So what's next? So I talked about using education as a tool to understand brain development, to understand how a child's experience shapes the development of brain circuits. Now we want to think about closing the circle and think about how we can use neuroscience as a tool to predict learning and personalize education. This is part of a broader mission, mission referred to as precision education, capitalizing on a wealth of data to understand unique characteristics of an individual to be able to personalize learning to the unique needs of that individual. So how are we going about this? Well, we want to see if we can predict individual differences in learning and prescribe the optimal intervention for an individual. So showing how this might work. So this is showing data, a measurement of this same white matter pathway, the arcuate fasciculus, <laughs> before children entered the intervention program. On the, this axis here is showing each individual's growth and reading skill, and this axis is showing a measurement of this individual's white matter structure. For this individual, we see uh, incredible growth in reading over the course of the intervention. You can think of this, we found the perfect intervention for this individual. Whereas this individual showed relatively limited growth, meaning we need to pursue different approaches. So how we're going about this is we're making measurements before our interventions to characterize individual differences in the physical structure of brain circuits. We're then enrolling children in different intervention programs, and then collecting outcome measures to see if we can predict based on these baseline biomarkers, uh, differences in children's outcomes. So I'm gonna end there. I wanna thank, of course, all of our supporters at Stanford and uh, elsewhere and the folks in my lab who've conducted all this research. Thank you.